It's, it's a weighty one today, which tells you how significant the lesson will be. They, they correlate. Just kidding. Um, so have, grab your hand out for <clears throat> Daniel Introductory Matters this morning. Um, <clears throat> just as a reminder now, next, next week, the elders are going to be having a very serious time together. I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's going to be a lot of fun, and we're having a retreat. You know how that goes. Uh, sometimes people bring BB guns and things like that. I don't know. Nate going to be there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so, but actually, to discuss some things. And so next week, um, I think Jason Sweezy will have the ad- all the adults together for a, maybe something that um, he would like to do with you, and then we'll be back at uh, Daniel then uh, after that. So it's, but it's good we can talk about introductory matters today together. So um, let's go ahead and, and pray. And, and by the way, it's good to be back together with you. I'm really excited about what we're going to be looking at in this magnificent book. So let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we, oh, Father, we humbly, all of us humbly, bow before you this morning. We, we really, as much as we understand, we can't even begin to understand just the majesty and the glory and the beauty and the purity and the holiness and the power and who you are as the great creator God of the universe. And uh, we thank you for bringing everything into being with the purpose of revealing yourself to creatures like us, the angelic beings and human beings. And Father, we thank you for a magnificent plan that where where you reveal yourself to us through the face and in the face of a human being, the Son of David, eternally united to God the Son, so that we can know you. Um, He became flesh so that we could behold your glory. He is the one who explains you to us. If we've seen him, as he told Philip, we've seen you, dear Father. So um, we want to behold you today. We want to begin to understand the significance of this great book of Daniel together. We pray that you would superintend over all that's done and said uh, so that you, dear Lord God, through Jesus Christ are exalted and set on display in the power of the Holy Spirit. So thank you for these uh, dear people who are here who want to grow in grace and the knowledge of who you are, dear Lord Jesus. We give our time to you for the glory of your great name. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> um, let's just, uh, I wrote down some thoughts, and we'll expand upon them a little bit today for sure, but uh, I, wa- I want to not only cover some introductory matters, but I want you to get a sense of the significance of the book of Daniel with respect to God and his plan and purpose for all time from the beginning and into eternity. It's that kind of book. It's that kind of book. Um, We're going to see that it's a book, Daniel is a book about the covenant faithfulness of God, the covenant faithfulness of God to the elect nation of Israel. This relationship between God and the nation began with the unconditional covenant God made with their father, Abraham, with the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we see that. I just listed, you know, when God comes to deliver them from Egypt, when God sent Moses to deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage, we read in Exodus 3, 6 through 8, when God addressed Moses at the burning bush, you're all familiar with this. And in verse 15, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. 
the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians. And we're going to see in Daniel there's this contrast in power, earthly powers and the power of God. And to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. God furthermore, in verse 15, said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, Yahweh, the great I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. He is a covenant-keeping God. And there's per praise God for that. But all the covenants that he brings are designed to do one thing, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. They're designed to do one thing. So, <clears throat> after delivering them from Egypt, God entered into the conditional Mosaic covenant with Israel, constituting them as a theocratic nation. And it, it, he uses the ancient Near Eastern a form of a suzerain vassal treaty in the Mosaic Covenant. The, the suzerain is the king, and, and the vassals are his subjects. And in this kind of covenant, he pledges himself to do certain things for them, to lead, to guide, to protect, provide, uh, watch over them. But then they pledge to obey what he gives them to do. Uh, and they do that. You remember when the law was given which is a reflection of his holy character. And Moses sprinkled the blood of the covenant on the people. They said, all that God has spoken, we will do, we will be obedient. Nice idea, but you have to have the right kind of heart to do that. Right? You can't just say you're going to do that. You have to have the right kind of heart. So um, through obedience to this covenant, they could experience God's promised covenantal blessings which, by the way, are directly related to the Abrahamic covenant blessings. But because of its conditional nature, if the nation refused to obey God, they would experience the promised covenantal curses. So, we know their history, right? Throughout their history, even though there were a few bright spots, the nation in general was a hard-hearted, stubborn rebellious and disobedient people. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? It's the way each one of you are born into this world, by the way. Rejecting Yahweh their God, the Lord their God, and embracing the false gods of the nations around them, which eventually resulted in their exile from the land of promise as predicted by Moses in Deuteronomy 28. Way back in Deuteronomy, we have this all laid out. You know, Moses tells them in 28, just to read a little, to get a flavor, the Lord will bring you and your king, whom you set over you, to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you will serve other gods of wood and stone. You shall become a whore, a proverb, a taunt among the people, where the Lord drives you. You're going to be cursed. You're going to be cursed. You shall have sons and daughters, verse 41, but they will not be yours, for they will go into captivity like Daniel and others. The locust is going to possess your trees, that type of thing. So all the curses will come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you would not obey the Lord your God and keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. And it wasn't just about keeping them in some kind of road obedience like the Pharisees. It was about keeping them with the right kind of heart, motivated out of love for God, faith in God, fear of God. So all this is going to happen on you. It's going to happen to you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, 
as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who will have no respect for the old nor show favor to the young. And I'm telling you, the Assyrians did this with the northern kingdom in 722, and they were an absolutely brutal people. And the Babylonians weren't much better who came and dispersed the uh, southern kingdom of Judah in three times, we'll see, three dates. Deuteronomy 29 again, in 29. Uh, it, it just talks about why the nations will see this and they'll say, why has the Lord done this to their land? He made it like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like scorched. Why this great outburst of anger? Then men will say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they have not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against that land to bring upon it every curse which is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and in fury and in great wrath. There's emotion here, isn't there? You don't do this to God. Great wrath and cast them into another land as it is this day. Now, because of the Abrahamic covenant, which is unconditional, he never throws them away ultimately. And he makes some other magnificent covenants with them that we will see have to do with his son. And that's what is so significant for the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. So <clears throat> it kind of helps us understand the context. God's heart what God did and why he did it, why Daniel's where he's at, right? This is the situation, this exile because of God's wrath and anger upon them, in which we find Daniel and other devout Jews. You know, it's interesting, when God judges a nation that's rebellious and sinful and wicked, it's not just the Israel, he does that with nations. Anyone who's in that nation who's righteous is going to suffer. It's just the way it works. Look at Jeremiah, who's in Jerusalem when all this is happening, one of God's children, you see. And just as a, just as a thought, as America plunges more into darkness and comes under the hand of God's judgment, his people are going to be impacted and affected. You're not going to be in a bubble walking around. The, fall, the collapse of an economy or the invasion of an army is going to affect you. That's where the people of God will shine. Daniel shined because of his love for God in the midst of this. And we're going to get to see that. We're going to get to see that. But it's true for us, too. So Daniel's in this situation. We will see that in spite of God's severe judgment... Their covenant-keeping God has not abandoned them because of his unconditional covenant with their fathers, the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, this is what's so wonderful, people, to shine the light on God's character and faithfulness to his word. It's in the time of their greatest distress and despair and hopelessness under God's hand of judgment as a nation under his hand of discipline as a nation, that God declares his intention to establish his future glorious kingdom under the Son of Man. We're going to see that. He's going to do it. And he also, at this time of exile, gives Israel the promise of a new covenant of restoration and redemption through the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. This is amazing. At their, in their darkest hour, he says, I'm going to fulfill my word to you. Believe my word. Believe my promises. Isn't this great? He hasn't changed, people. He hasn't changed. He's going to fulfill his word to you, his promises to you. In the midst of the darkest times, you cling to them like Daniel did, as we're going to see. 
So Daniel's a book about the future of Israel and the Gentile nations, revealing God's sovereignty over the nations. It's unbelievable. He humbles the kings of these pagan nations. God never steps down from the throne. His plan is certain because of who he is. He's going to do it. His sovereignty over the nations as he moves in history to fulfill his covenant promises with Israel and the nations, culminating in the second coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory to defeat the final anti-God kingdom under the Antichrist and establish the glorious messianic kingdom on earth, bringing blessings to Israel and the nations for the glory and vindication of his great name. I mean, this is a magnificent book, folks. This is a big picture book, <laughs> big picture. So let's cover a few of the, the, the basics then. And uh, we'll come back to the big picture in a little bit. I want you to see this. I want you to get this. Anyway, date and authorship. And by the way, the, the things I give you, in, usually in these background material things, I'm not an ancient Near Eastern scholar. So I use guys who know what they're talking about. And most of this comes from... Uh, a man named Tanner, J.P. Tanner. It's in the Evangelical Exegetical Commentary on Daniel. And as I've read through uh, it, it's very good, very thorough. At the end of this, I give you a, like a five-page outline that is very detailed, so you can go there, and it's, all, it's just like a summary of almost every paragraph for you to have. So the information we have here with regard to history and these kinds of things comes from him. Um, you'll see at the end of your handout, I have uh, a chart here on the world empires that unfold in Daniel with some very important dates for you to have, and then a map of the short little jaunt Daniel had to take to get to the destination where he was lived his life in Babylon. So just for the fun, you have those. Um, I'd use the screen with colors and stuff, but I'm such a nerd of lack of understanding of all that stuff. Um, you get it in a handout. It's, it's just a good thing you're not getting it on yellow pad papers, uh, to be honest with you, because uh, it it's hard. For, I get it in the computer, though. Praise God. Anyway, historically, the Hebrew and Christian tradition has consistently attributed the authorship of the book to the prophet Daniel, of course who wrote in the latter part of the 6th century B.C., the reference to the third year of Cyrus in Daniel 10.1 is about 536-535 B.C., is the last mentioned event involving the person of Daniel. And this would suggest that the book was written shortly after this final vision given to Daniel. Now, critical scholarship... Uh, people who do not believe in supernatural predictive prophecy propose, adamantly propose, that Daniel was written in the second century after things happen because you can't know they're going to happen ahead of time. We don't believe in that. So after these things unfolded with regard to the Greek Empire and Antiochus the Fourth and all that, that's when he wrote the book and you know said it was prophecy. He wrote it in 164 and 165 B.C. Um, as the reign of Antiochus IV was drawing to a close. Here's the point, though. The whole issue is not merely academic. You know, ac academic guys, they debate dates and this, but this is significant. It's not merely an ac academic discussion, as there's a lot riding, Tanner says, on the verdict. If the book purports to be written by Daniel in the 6th century B.C., but in reality is prophecy after the fact, then this calls into question what? The absolute integrity of the Bible, the character of God, his ability to give you the end from the beginning as he's ordained it. So it's not a, it's not a small issue. God's word is trustworthy. So men defend it. Good, good 
conservative scholars. So I listed here just some of the things that support the traditional view. And here's the key, <laughs> Jesus. This does it for me. I mean, you know, the testimony of Christ in Matthew 24, 15. We're going to talk about this later, this, the Olivet Discourse in Daniel. He, quote, okay, anyway, this comes from Tanner. In Daniel 12, 1, I'm sorry, 12, 11, reference is made to an abomination of desolation that would be carried out in the latter days. The Lord Jesus, in his Olivet Discourse, made the comment, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee. Now, Tanner makes this observation. Jesus did not say which was spoken of in the book of Daniel, but rather which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet directly from his mouth. This reflects his opinion, Jesus' opinion, that number one, Daniel the prophet authored these words from the final ch chapter of the book, and two, this final section of Daniel was not fulfilled later on in the person of Antiochus IV, okay? To me, that does it, because Jesus is God in the flesh. Some people, that doesn't convince, so let's go to a few more. <laughs> Evidence from the Qumran discoveries. This is kind of cool. Portions of Daniel. You know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are? You know where they found the portions of the Old Testament that confirm the Old Testament's truths and accuracy? Anyway, portions of Daniel have surfaced among the documents from Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which would strongly suggest a date before the Maccabean era. Since all the Qumran fragments and scrolls are copies, the original autograph of Daniel and other Old Testament canonical works must of necessity be advanced well before the Maccabean period if the proper minimum of time is allowed for the book to be circulated and accepted as scripture, okay? That's just a historical fact. And it kind of goes along with the third point, acceptance into the Jewish canon. If Daniel had indeed been a second century BC work by an author attempting to disguise the book as written in the sixth century BC, isn't that foolish how men come up with this stuff? Because they cannot believe or accept a God who's God. So we come up with all these weird ideas. They were faking it. It's extremely unlikely that the Jews would have allowed this to slip by unnoticed into the Hebrew canon. Clearly, they would have given it uh, the utmost scrutiny before accepting it as the word of God. I like this one, too, and the number fourth one. Ezekiel mentions Daniel. Ezekiel was excellent. He, he's a... Contemporary of Daniel, okay? And, and, and in his interaction with God, in Ezekiel 14, 14, uh, it says, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst by their own righteousness, they could only deliver themselves. God's determined to judge, and the, even these righteous men being present wouldn't stop that from happening, but he mentions Daniel, Ezekiel does. Okay, same thing in Ezekiel 14.20, and then in Ezekiel 28.3, Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you, you see. So I think that's strong evidence, wouldn't you agree? Because the conservative scholars agree that Ezekiel wrote earlier, and he's talking about Daniel. And uh, there's no doubt that this is the Daniel who wrote the book the Daniel who wrote the book. So, all that's part of it. Number five, we don't have to go into a lot, but this whole idea of his understanding of the culture and customs that he writes about, a couple just to think through for A and B maybe. The author, Daniel, was sufficiently well informed about 6th century B.C. life in Babylon to represent Nebuchadnezzar as being able to formulate a change and change Babylonian law, which with absolute sovereignty, that was true for the Babylonian kings, 
while showing that Darius the Mede was powerless to alter the rigid laws of the Medes and the Persians. That was true of that empire. So he, 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 he knew those things. The author was quite correct in recording the change from punishment by fire in the time of the Babylonians. Remember, we're going to see the furnace of fire. To punishment by being thrown into a lion's den under the Persians since fire was sacred to the Persians in their religion type of things. They wouldn't do that. That's pretty cool stuff. Okay, page four. Page four. I'm not going to read C because I don't, didn't quite, it was really cool, but it's about the name of a city, but it's kind of involved. It's kind of academic. Okay, now, this next part is, is really kind of neat. This, the literary structure of Daniel, and it's going to lead us into a discussion of the big picture, in a sense, because of how this focuses our attention in the book of Daniel and what's most important in the book. So follow through with me. We're going to cover this and then dive into some other things. The first major section, the first chapter is kind of the historical setting, but the first major section, chapters 2 through 7, emphasize the Gentile nations under whom Israel is being disciplined. We're going to see that. This would explain why these chapters were written in Aramaic, the lingua franca of the Gentile world in Daniel's day. Isn't that interesting? Aramaic, similar to Hebrew. Since the general context of the whole book is the theological reason for Israel's exile. We'll, we'll see that in chapter 9 in Daniel's prayer. But chapters 2 through 7 pertain to the Gentile nations in their relationship to Israel's exile. Israel's discipline, this is really important. You know, we think of, of the 70 years of, you know, being in exile and they're brought back. And, but here's, this is a great observation Israel's discipline, when, we, when you read the book and God's plan and purpose and how it's going to unfold, Israel's discipline would not be a mere 70 years, but rather a discipline spanning the complete course of history up to the second coming of Christ. The second coming. Do you see what he's saying? Now! They're still under God's hand of discipline. They have never been recovered throughout the centuries. They have always been under the hand of Gentile rulers. You can read, remember in Luke chapter uh, 21, when Jesus is talking about the end times, the first thing he talks about is the historical destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And he, he puts it this way. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled with regard to God's plan and purpose for them and for everything else that he's going to bring about. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land of Israel and wrath to this people, the nation. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And get this, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You know when that is completed? When Christ comes and crushes the kingdom of the Antichrist at his second advent. That's when it's going to be finished. But it says that in Daniel. It says that in Daniel. Tanner says, only when Christ returns, the Antichrist is defeated, and Messiah's kingdom is formally established, will Israel's discipline be lifted and I, I, we, we're not going to go into this right now, but the bottom line is that can only happen as God applies the new covenant to them as a nation. The new covenant we're participating in and enjoying now in this wonderful 
body of Christ. Blessing can only come to a redeemed people, right? That's when it's planned to happen. We'll see, you can see that in Romans chapter 11. Until then, she will be dominated by Gentile kingdoms. In the final analysis, God's discipline on Israel will be removed, and believing Israel, believing Israel, new covenant Israel, will be allowed to enjoy Messiah's kingdom. In light of what is revealed in the opening and concluding chapters, then, of this section, 2 through 7, um, depict the role, character, and succession of the Gentile nations of the world under whom Israel is being disciplined before Messiah's kingdom. These chapters affirm that these Gentile kingdoms have the right of world sovereignty under God's authority. And when you go to Revelation and you see the kingdom of the Antichrist and he's given authority over the world, over every tribe and tongue and people and nation for three and a half years, those are divine passives. He has no authority unless it's given to him by God. Who's in control? God's in control. So he is given that authority. These Gentile nations right now are being given this authority under God's supreme sovereign control, including the United States of America. We're not where we are by accident. It's God's purpose, plan, will, sovereignty that has put us where we are as a nation. Until God is pleased to establish the messianic kingdom and that no adversary can successfully oppose him. I'm t <laughs> We're gonna I mean, it, it kind of drives you into Psalm 2. You know, the nations are raging against him, and he's laughing. Because he controls the nations. We're going to see it in Daniel. <laughs> he humbles the mightiest of kings. Because of who he is and what he's doing. The second major section is chapters 7 through 12, more particularly addressed, addressed the na to the nation of Israel, which explains why we have a shift back to Hebrew now after uh, chapter 7. Each of Daniel's four visions emphasizes the future ruler. There's a future ruler who will stand in opposition to Israel and God and who will be sent will be bent, I'm sorry, on persecuting her. Of course, he's under the control of the enemy who hates God's truth and God's plan and purpose, Satan, wants to destroy it. This is the Antichrist who will serve as God's final means of his discipline on Israel. Though in chapter 8, he is typified by Antiochus. We're going to see that. God lays the foundation, as he often does, by prefiguring this man in history. And we're going to see that he does that with Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who emulates what the eventual Antichrist will be and do, thus serving as a biblical pattern or type of the Antichrist. The motif of suffering at the hands of the future Antichrist thus undergirds chapters 7 through 12. But we're going to see... And that's where, that's where we get to the final point, which is really important. Daniel 7, then, okay, serves as a hinge to both the major sections of the book. What has been introduced in chapters 1 through 6 is reiterated in chapter 7. The role of Gentile kingdoms and their subjection to God's sovereignty and eventual kingdom. And what is highlighted in chapter 7 the little horn that comes out of the fourth beast, the Antichrist, is played out in the remaining chapters of the book. So, he says, through such a literary technique as this, with that chapter being the focus and hinge of the book, the author carefully focused the reader's attention on chapter 7. And I'm telling you, people, chapter 7 is one of the most glorious chapters in the whole Bible. This chapter is the most beautiful expression 
of God's ultimate purpose of good, not only for Israel, but for all the peoples. 7, 13, and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. But when that kingdom comes, it crushes all the other kingdoms to dust as it's established. Okay, now, we're going to, I want to do something here. There, it, we may come back to it, but here, let me just say, the rest of the handout is good history. He talks about the Assyrian background, the rise of Babylon to power, and then he goes into the uh, Judah's exile, and he talks about the, diff, the final kings of Israel before the exile, and he talks about the different historical events taking place as the ancient Near East is overrun by the kingdoms of Assyria and Egypt and Babylon, and Israel's right smack in the middle of it all. And, and you can see how it all develops with the kings and their uh, deportations and that type thing. And let me just go to because uh, uh, page 10... See how quick my wife would be so proud of me. <laughs> I just went through how many pages in three seconds. Okay. I want to come back, though. But anyway, on page 10, to summarize that history with respect to Daniel and, and Babylon and the Jews, anyway, there were three, you have to summarize, there were three major deportations of Jews to exile in Babylon. 605 B.C., the deportation, it's all under Nebuchadnezzar. The deportation was limited to a number, and in your history you can find them highlighted at different places in the history, but this deportation was limited to a number of the nobility and leading youths of the city. Daniel and his companions were taken at this time, 605. 597, the next one, in response to the rebellion of Jehoiakim, and Jehoiachin, about 10,000 captives were taken to Babylon, including Ezekiel. So D Daniel's been there for a while, about uh, eight years before Ezekiel shows up. Okay. And then in 586, now remember, Jeremiah's still in Jerusalem during this whole time, and he's getting ready to go through the siege of Jerusalem where moms eat their own kids to live. It's horrible. He's there. 586, Zedekiah's rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar brought on the final siege, which culminated in 586 with the city and the temple being destroyed and many Jews being killed. Many more who were not killed were deported to Babylon. Okay, so that's a summary. Then you have the outline, and then you have those wonderful... Uh, I have a conclusion. Maybe I'll get to that at the end here. But right now, I want to just kind of back up and do a little big picture, big picture I, summary for you, okay? I mean, when we think about what God is doing in the book of Daniel, he, he is moving majestically with omnipotent power and sovereignty, not only to be faithful to discipline Israel, but all these great Gentile powers are unfolding according to his good pleasure to do one thing. Where is God going with everything? He's going one place to enthrone his king on the throne of his kingdom for the glory of his name. Right? That's what we're going to see in chapter 7. It is Psalm 2, people. It is Psalm 2, which is a reflection of the Davidic promise. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But in Psalm 2, he says, I'm going to install my king on Zion, my holy mountain. It's coming. So let's just back up. 
because I, I want you to see that from the beginning of Genesis 1-1, God has been moving to do this. When God creates, in the beginning, he creates a perfect environment, right? And in that perfect environment, environment Adam and Eve are... Uh, they're created to rule over the creation, right? You can go back to Genesis 1, 26. They're supposed to represent God and rule over the creation under God. They are reflecting him to the creation. So they're supposed to be doing it. He names the animals. He, Adam names his wife. There's authority. There's, there's reflection of God's rule over the creation, uh, but that, that's happening in the context of a wonderful love relationship between Adam and Eve and God, right? God would walk with them in the cool of the day, right? Perfect love relationship reflecting what they were meant. What, then what happens? The fall. The fall wasn't a surprise to God. It had to happen for God to accomplish his purpose to exalt one person, God the Son for all eternity, who's joined with mankind as the son of David. So the fall happens. The relationship with God is severed. The rule over the creation is totally tarnished and supplanted, right? And that's horrible. And, if, and, and God judges the nations at the Tower of Babel, creates the nations, and at the end of chapters 11 in Genesis, it's hopeless for us. Hopeless. What happens in Genesis chapter 12? Right off the bat. God's covenant with Abraham. So now God's going to move through covenant promise to recover what Adam lost. He's going to recover the rule over the creation. He's going to recover the relationship that was lost. And you know how he's going to do it? Through one person through one person, to exalt that person for all eternity. Who is it? Jesus, right? So in this area of rule, from the very beginning, God has a plan. And you can go back to, uh, did I write, put some of these in there? Maybe a little bit. I've got them all mixed up. Genesis 48. Okay, remember when Jacob is blessing his kids? And with regard to Judah, this is what he says. Here it is, right off the bat. Judah, your brother shall praise you. 48, not 8 through 10. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, the kingship, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until the one appointed comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. <laughs> Guess who this is going to be? Right? From the beginning, he's planned a kingship to be brought into place before it's even brought into place. And in Deuteronomy chapter 17, in the giving of the law, there's a law for the king. Immediately, there's a law for the king in Deuteronomy 17. You shall set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses one from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he's, he's not to be proud, multiply horses, uh, cause the people to return to Egypt for blessing, since the Lord has said you shall never again return that way. He shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away. Who did that? Solomon. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Why? Because it's God who is your treasure. Right? Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom. He's supposed to be a righteous king. Listen to this. This is great. When he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself 
You don't have people do it for you. You do it. You write for yourself, king, a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. Make sure you get it right. What happens when you have to do that? You got to think about it. You got to write it out. You got to dwell on it. Now you make your own copy. And here's what's going to happen with it. It shall be with him. And he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. Isn't that amazing? You know why they're booted out of the land? Because there was only a few kings who were like this. The rest of the kings were not like this. And so the whole nation goes into darkness and God brings judgment. And then the kingship stops. When they came back from exile, they were hoping for the kingship to be reestablished. They built the temple, no king. Centuries go by, no king. So now they're hoping, they're hoping for this ideal Davidic king, the one who's promised to come. You see him in Isaiah chapter 11, a a king of righteousness who judges fairly, who's filled with the spirit of God. This king is the one they, oh, we want him to come. This king, right, is the one who has to come. And that kingship was established in 2 Samuel 7 in a promise, an unconditional covenant promise God makes with David. And he tells David, I'm going to build your house, David. And I'm going to bring your house, your throne, David, your lineage, David, your kingdom is going to endure before me forever. And in that line of kings, you know, it would have been an unbroken line of kings on the throne if they'd obeyed him but they didn't. But this king, this is an unconditional promise. And you know what, folks? This is really important. The Abrahamic covenant promise, the new covenant promise, really have to do with us and blessing to us. But the Davidic covenant is not about you and me. We're blessed by that covenant because of who who fulfills it. But that's a covenant God the father makes with his own son because he calls the Davidic king. Knowing where it's going, God calls the Davidic king. I'm going to be a father to him. He's going to be a son to me. You you know why that's in place? Because of the relationship in the Godhead between father and son. So now this king, when he comes on the scene, is, is the son of David. He is the son of God as the king, but he's more than that, isn't he? He's literally God the Son in the flesh. So when God says, I'm going to be a father to him and he's going to be a son to me, wow. God lays the foundation for what we have. The king who is coming. And that king, his kingdom is the one Daniel's talking about. This is the son of man who's going to come up to the to God on the throne and receive the kingdom and all the nations are going to worship and serve him. That's who he is. So where is God moving? When Jesus is born into the world and Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her who's in the womb, he says, Mary, this child in you will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. That's the Davidic king. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Right? And he will be great, and he's going to reign over the house of Jacob, Israel, forever, and his kingdom is going to have no end. It's a fulfillment of the Davidic covenant promise. It's a fulfillment that's on the table here in the book of Daniel that God pledges himself to do as he sovereignly moves through human history to bring about his kingdom, which will crush the darkness 
of the kingdom of the Antichrist when it's all said and done. You see how important this book is. God is at work. God is moving. God is fulfilling his word. And and I'm telling you, folks, that Davidic covenant, he will fulfill. It involves not just a Davidic kingship, though. It involves Israel. Go back and read 2 Samuel 17 and how David prays about the fulfillment of that covenant. And, And that's not a bad thing. That's just God being faithful to his word, to do what he said he's going to do for the glory of his great name. So we have this magnificent promise that has to do, that's coming in Daniel. We're going to get to it. But you have to see that this book is about a sovereign God who humbles the Gentile kings, the greatest kings. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of kings. Right? Remember what he says after he was humbled by God? At the end of this period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Right? All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does his will according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what are you doing? Right? He gives the kingdom to whom he wants to give it to. And Nebuchadnezzar learned that lesson because that's the lesson Daniel said, you better learn You better learn that that's the way it is, Nebuchadnezzar. It's not about you. It's about who God determines is going to rule, and we're moving toward the time when the Son of Man is going to rule over this planet for the glory of God. You think it's going to happen? It's going to happen. It wasn't just Nebuchadnezzar, right? Darius the king can't go back on his word. Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, men of every language who are living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree in all the dominion of my kingdom. Men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. Wow. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. It's a pagan king. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Isn't that amazing? This is a great book. And it has a great purpose and message. And so we have the privilege of diving in there together. And it's now 10 o'clock. So you can read the rest of the handout. But just keep in mind what's going on and why. This is a big picture book, folks, that is applicable to us right now in the United States in 2021. We're in this flow. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the book of Daniel. We just, oh, please, cause us to bow before your word. Cause us to humbly, sweetly submit to who you are and what you're doing. Help us to know that all that you're doing has one purpose, to exalt the second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, you have highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, which is above every name, so that at his name... Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, to your glory, Father. Thank you for this plan. Thank you that we can be part of it. Thank you that our little lives right now have to have, are about the same purpose. Everything about us, every breath, every thought, every act, every deed has one purpose, to exalt and set on display the Lord Jesus. We're involved in the same purpose that you are, Father. 
Help us to be those kind of people today. Help us to live longing and looking and loving your appearing, Jesus, which could come any day. In your name we pray and thank you for this time. Amen. You're welcome.